I recently made a video on this disastrous math problem posted to Reddit. The problem with the problem wasn't the problem, but the teacher's problem with admitting she's wrong. The question asked, how many rectangular faces does a hexagonal pyramid have? We can complete this exercise together now. And sure enough, there's not even a ping on even the most sensitive rectangle radar when looking at a hexagonal pyramid. The student's answer of zero rectangular faces was correct. The teacher argued that the correct answer was in fact six, that there were six rectangular faces which could be found in the base of the pyramid. I, very bravely and very wisely, offered that this might have been her explanation. There's one rectangle, there's two rectangles, there's three rectangles, and it's trivial to see that you can find the other three on the other side. In any event, within the span of four days, it became my most viewed video of all time, not counting that time I ranked the different ways you can write the number two. And so I feel obliged to give you the latest update to this story. We're going to take a look at this shocking development, courtesy of Newsweek's reporting, and then we'll revisit the problem of finding rectangles and a hexagon from a more serious mathematical perspective that will involve a cool theorem from the early 1800s. Now again, the big issue is that the story, as told by the OP, who goes by JT in the Newsweek article, according to him, the teacher doubled down in a really ridiculous way for her wrong answer of this problem, telling the niece that her correct answer was wrong. It was a crying shame, too, because it seemed like it would have been so easy to say that the question was supposed to say triangular faces, since we see there are six triangular faces in a hexagonal pyramid, or that maybe the question was supposed to say hexagonal prism. We can see there are six rectangular faces in a hexagonal prism. But of course, the teacher didn't do that, and some people reacted very extremely. This guy even goes as far as to say the teacher's error is criminal, and they should be sent to prism. You guys are horrible. Another fella brings up how the consequences of this teacher's mistake might run even deeper. Plot twist, in a past life, this teacher was an architect in ancient Egypt. The Great Pyramid of Giza was supposed to have been the Great Prism of Giza. At Haifoff also mentions this Egypt place, mentioning that they must have been inspired by the pyramid from Super Mario 64, which is really cool. Going back to the Newsweek article, I'd like to nitpick just a little bit. It begins referring to the math problem as troubling, and I don't know if I'd go that far. I mean, it's a little odd because the correct answer is zero. I wouldn't say it's troubling. Sure, it's a little odd to ask fifth graders to count something that's not there, but if this is troubling, then trouble's easier to find than I thought. They go on to say that math differs from other subjects and that the answers students give are either definitively correct or correct but the author's forgetting the other two possibilities of incorrect and definitively incorrect. So, small error there. They go on to describe things we've already discussed. JT says, The question must have meant to ask how many triangular faces are present on a hexagonal pyramid, and the teacher just wasn't in the mindset to challenge the textbook that day. It does indeed take a lot of emotional training and mental stamina to arrive to the classroom with a challenge the textbook mindset. When I was teaching calculus, did I arrive to class ready to challenge the third edition of Stuart's calculus? Yeah, you betcha I was ready. But would I have been prepared to challenge a first edition copy of Stuart's calculus? I mean, probably not. This is a rare first edition, and I wouldn't want to get on a bad page of such a rare textbook. But of course, now owning two first edition copies of Stuart's calculus, even this gem is not immune to my bold challenges. Plus, while it's valuable to maintain a positive relationship on a textbook like Stuart's calculus, a bad page is hard to find. Oh! The article goes on, though it may have only amounted to one question on the homework sheet, JT said he felt it was important for his niece to pull her teacher up on what was either a confusing or fundamentally flawed question. Are these articles written by people? I'm, I am struggling to believe it. I feel like the people who wrote this article must be the same people who wrote How to Learn Math by... Sm I'm not going to go there, never mind. Last we knew though, this is where we left off. The niece, her uncle, and indeed the rest of the world could do nothing but be troubled by this problem. In a moment, I'll show you the dramatic update. But after originally recording this video, I realized that 
Newsweek didn't really offer much new information at all. In fact, the original poster went back to his original thread and gave us some updates himself. The one funny piece of information that we're not going to see in the Newsweek article is that the OP apparently 3D printed the relevant shapes. And I feel like this is a last resort option because if you're going to imply that the math teacher needs a 3D manipulative to understand that hexagonal pyramids don't actually have rectangular faces, well, that's a pretty big insult. And if you think the teacher will not admit when they're wrong, this is playing with fire. But hopefully the teacher took it all in stride. I mean, what math teacher wouldn't want to have some cool 3D prints like this? So I wanted to include that detail, but let's go back to our main narrative. Of course, the greatest stories are not about things that happen, but the people things happen to. And in this tale, we are witnessing some fine character development. JT's niece ended up sticking to her guns, and it paid off. The teacher admitted that my niece was 100% correct, JT said. She said that it was a typo in the book, so again, the disagreement here must be due to an answer in the book, because there's no typo here unless there's a corresponding answer that disagrees with the question. Assuming that's the case, though, she says it was just a typo, and the question meant to ask how many triangular faces are included in a hexagonal pyramid. Though I can't help but wonder if the teacher just knows that the textbook said that answer six, and so obviously then either that answer is a typo or this question is a typo. How would she know that the typo is that it was supposed to be triangular faces, when hexagonal prism would also give an answer of six if we had rectangular faces to count? I don't know, ultimately doesn't matter. There are a few ways she could actually know what it's supposed to say if perhaps she had a newer edition of the resource book. Now, perhaps the teacher would have been happy to admit she was wrong from the beginning, but she just had a very brief conversation with the niece and maybe there was some miscommunication. On the other hand, maybe the teacher would have insisted on sticking to her, uh, initial beliefs, but then the pressure of Newsweek reaching out to her was just a bit too much. Oh, and by the way, this woman has nothing to do with any of this. I just included this in the printout because I thought it was kind of amusing. Elementary school teacher uses Taylor Swift to teach multiplication. I don't think I would mind that one bit. But let's shake this off and revisit the rectangle in a hexagon issue. Obviously, it's very easy to inscribe a rectangle in a hexagon, but a separate way we might approach approach this question is to ask if it's possible to cut a hexagon into pieces and reassemble those pieces into a rectangle. Of course, if we could somehow slice and dice this and then reassemble the pieces into a rectangle, the rectangle would have to have the same area as the hexagon. If this hexagon had an area of A, the rectangle we assemble would also have to have an area of A. But is this enough? Certainly we can't make just any rectangle out of this hexagon. It would have to have area A, but can we do that? You can try coming up with some ways that we might cut a hexagon into a finitely many pieces and then try to reassemble those pieces into a rectangle. Here's one possible pair of cuts we might make. This gets us a rectangle instantly, but then we're kind of stuck with the other pieces and there's no way to bring them together with the rectangle to form one complete rectangle out of all of the pieces. And just to clarify, by the way, we're allowed to translate or slide the pieces around and to rotate them. You can't flip them. Cutting a hexagon right across these two vertices seems kind of nice. We get these two beautiful isosceles Fossilies trapezoids that fit together really snugly but it doesn't make a rectangle. If you work with it a bit, it won't take long to find some ways to cut a hexagon into pieces that can be reassembled into a rectangle. But there's one way in particular I want to show you just because it touches on some easy generalization. A hexagon, like every polygon, can be cut into triangles. So let's try cutting this into triangles since we know that every polygon can be cut that way. Of course, with the hexagon, we are cutting it into six equilateral triangles. Now that we've cut the hexagon into six equilateral triangles, the problem of assembling it into a rectangle is a bit simpler because now the question is just this. 
Is it possible to cut an equilateral triangle into pieces that can be reassembled into a rectangle? If that's possible, then we could just do that with every one of these triangles and stitch it all together for one big rectangle. And it should come as no surprise that indeed we can cut equilateral triangles into pieces that come together as rectangles. But it doesn't even need to be equilateral, we can use any old triangle to do this. And in fact, it's a very simple procedure. First, we need to cut horizontally across the triangle at the halfway point. So let's measure the height of the triangle. I don't like centimeters, let's switch. So we can see the height of this triangle is just about a full inch. So halfway up is at a half inch. All right, I'll do my best horizontal cut. We wanna cut parallel to the base. Now we've got this piece, which is almost like a rectangle, but with some parts cut out of the ends. And we've got this piece we just cut off. I'm going to cut this piece perpendicularly to the base and across that top vertex. Now these two smaller pieces we have can be used to fill in the gaps. Indeed, this triangular piece goes there and this one fits perfectly right here. Doing this all by hand, it doesn't look perfect, but it does work perfectly in theory. Hopefully you get the idea. So in total, that took two cuts. We ended up cutting the triangle into three pieces to make the rectangle. And of course we could carry out that same procedure with all of these equilateral triangles that came from the hexagon, reassemble them all into rectangles and attach all of those into one big rectangle. Since that would involve all six of these triangles getting cut into three pieces, we would end up with an 18 piece solution for reassembling a hexagon into a rectangle. It's certainly possible to do much better than that though. You can cut a hexagon into way fewer than 18 pieces to turn it into a rectangle. And I'm curious to see the solutions you'll come up with in the comments. Just for an example, we could take the beginning cut that we did earlier, cutting the hexagon into into two isosceles trapezoids, and then with just a couple more cuts, we can actually make this work. This isosceles trapezoid, of course, could be a rectangle if only we could fill in these triangular gaps. Thankfully, we can fill those in by cutting them out of the other isosceles trapezoid. Now we can take those triangles that we cut out to turn this isosceles trapezoid into a beautiful rectangle. When we cut that other isosceles trapezoid, it just left another rectangle, which we can stick on the end so that all the pieces come together to form a single rectangle. And this is certainly better than 18. We've assembled the hexagon into a rectangle by cutting it into just four pieces. And you can get a more convincing view that the pieces fit together with the assistance of technology. These are the cuts that we made. Of course, the two triangular pieces fit the whole isosceles trapezoid no problem because they share that side of the regular hexagon. When we take this triangular piece and slide it over here to the end of that isosceles trapezoid, you can see that it's this side of the triangle that's left on the end, which does of course match up perfectly with this rectangle that we cut out. Of course, the beautiful thing here is that there's nothing special about hexagons and rectangles. This works with any two polygons of equal area. And this fact that any two polygons of equal area can be cut into finitely many pieces and reassembled into each other is called the wallace bollier gerwin theorem, named after Wallace, Bollier, and Gerwin. This is William Wallace, and this is Farkas Bollier, who is actually a close friend of Carl Gauss. The theorem was first proven by Wallace way back in 1807, and the other two proved the theorem independently. Since 1807, of course, much more on this subject has been studied and published. There is in fact notation for the number of pieces that we need to cut things into that we were talking about a moment ago. The notation uses a lowercase sigma, and this is a measure of the degree of decomposability of two polygons. We just showed for for example, abusing the notation a little bit by using pictures here, that the number of pieces a hexagon must be cut into so that it can be reassembled into a rectangle of the same area is no more than 18. This notation represents the minimum. So by finding a way to do it with 18 pieces, we know the minimum is less than or equal to 18. So was the teacher wrong about rectangular faces in hexagonal pyramids? Yes. But was she onto something? 
Well, probably not. Now you may be thinking, wow, this is a pretty interesting theorem and it's easy to see how that triangle argument could be generalized to make a proof for all polygons. And perhaps a strategy similar to that could prove this theorem as well in the 3D case. Ultimately, we don't have to worry about it too much. Thanks to Newsweek, we know that two polyhedra of equal volume can be cut into finitely many pieces and reassembled into each other is a statement that's either correct or definitively correct. I'm on table, I'm doing art to keep the cable cut and untuck the table. If Texas instruments don't reply, I think this time it might be fatal. Wish to sell my own fake, cause I'm traded. Hate the odds that I calculated. Press and pull a brain and push it all the way through the whole blue planet. Faded. Psychosomatic habits, why you so, so.